So what were the questions? So um, you're teaching uh, music oh, yeah. and, and a... It's uh, a pedagogy seminar that actually is going to be training all the music department graduate students to teach both music and Asian music And it is also combined with a professional development component, which is things like workshops on CV writing, grant writing, uh, the job market, publications, stuff like that. So that's my other class for the fall. Mm -hmm. In the spring, I'm going to teach a class on music and childhood, which is a new class I've designed, especially for, it's going to be a 4,000 so for both undergraduate and graduate students. And then the other course I would teach is a, I mean, it's for advanced undergraduates and, and then for graduate students, um, well, any graduate student, really. And it's kind of an interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, trans-historical class on music and childhood. I've published a couple of co-edited volumes on music and childhood. And then the other class I'll teach in the spring term next year would be a graduate seminar on medieval music, some aspect of medieval music. Um, and what are, you, what are you working on right now? I just finished a book on a Jesuit in the middle of the 18th century who was studying medieval manuscripts of music in Toledo Cathedral for five years from 1750 to 1755 and working with a calligrapher who actually made these uh, incredible copies and facsimiles of a lot of the manuscripts. So this was a Jesuit who was involved in many, many different things, but I'm, so I was focusing on that one aspect of his work. It started out as a political project, a government commission um, to transcribe documents, that archival documents that they would use in negotiations with the Vatican, with the Spanish government and the Vatican, over the Patronato Real, which is basically the claims of the, of the crown over ecclesiastical property, both in Spain and also actually in the New World. And, um, but as a, as a larger historical project on the history of kind of Spanish um, patrimony and intellectual and cultural legacy, he became very interested in medieval liturgical and musical manuscripts. So my book is about that. It's about you know, medievalism, and the reception of the Middle Ages, the development of the historical sciences in Enlightenment Spain, the early Enlightenment Spain, and about how people interpreted various aspects of the Spanish Middle Ages in the context of um, Bourbon Spain. So trying to use aspects of the past, such as the history of the Visigoths, um, the history of Castile, the history of uh, the city of Toledo, and aspects of Spanish culture from the Middle Ages in a way to create an image of, to create an ideal of continuity from early medieval Spain through to Bourbon Spain as part of a larger ideological building of the absolutist state at that time. Um, for our music humanities, I mean, it seems, I guess, of all the core requirements, I guess kind of the one that doesn't I don't want to say fit in, but but it, I guess the most different from any other kind of college curriculum you'll get. Can you just, I mean, talk about where you see music humanities fitting into a student's rounded education and the world in general? And so you mean you think it doesn't fit in even as much as Artham does? Um, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, I guess I guess the two of them with the sister courses mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, they're both one semester courses. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, I was just wanted to make sure I got the point, the context of the question. I mean. The music is very much part of a liberal education in the sense that what we're doing in music hum is the way that people learn to analyze a painting visually or other art object in art hum, in music hum, it's the sonic object, so it's the sound object. And so in a way you could say, well, music is the text in music hum, so that people learn in lit hum to read text closely and to understand how to take apart a text. They learn that with music in music hum. So it's in a way saying that texts are not limited to verbal texts. Texts are also musical and visual texts. Um, I imagine that teaching music home in New York City is also kind of a boom. Do you, oh yeah. Do you, I mean, do you uh, can you talk just a little bit about the interaction of the city's offerings with with the class? Yes, um, we've had for many years a program where the core curriculum helps us bring students to the opera. The core curriculum um, has supplemented and uh, has uh, reduced the cost of admission for students in, in music home and other students as well now through ArtsLink. Used to be New York City Opera and now we go to the Metropolitan Opera. So there's an opera, a course-wide opera every semester. 
then students are encouraged to go to all kinds of professional concerts. And ArtsLink helps, CU Arts helps get other opportunities with a reduced admission fees. But I think there are a lot of student tickets. Miller Theater offers $7 Miller uh, tickets. And so we encourage and in fact require students to go to tons of events in the city. And also there are a lot on campus that they can attend. So we want them to go to professional concerts. Uh, performances, they can also take advantage of the amateur ones that are on campus or student concerts. Student concerts are not necessarily amateur in that many students are professional musicians. But yes, yeah, so there's a lot of interaction and we have musicians who come on campus that are actually, it's part of the music com programming to have groups, an ensemble in residence every semester that do this presentation that does recitals. So it's a professional ensemble but they, they offer a specific program tailor-made for music humanities. It's very, very yeah. nice. I it's wish I was in college still. Yes, <laughs> come back, come back. Do another BA. Yeah. Um, it's, no, it's really, it is great. So there's a lot of, we really, really involve students in live music. We even have, although this is not out in the city, this is on campus, we even have a program through the core curriculum of bringing jazz musicians into every classroom of music home that wants it. It's, um, again, very generously sponsored by the core curriculum where they actually have their student jazz musicians, but their students, they are, can also be professional jazz musicians, they're not just amateur, and they come in, everybody who requests an ensemble can have a visiting, you know, a guest ensemble for one day and a lecture on jazz, because jazz is part of the music comp curriculum now, has been for six years. Okay, um, so uh, I guess now we get to the less serious questions. Um, uh, so uh, wh where do you live right now? I live on Broadway and 111. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, uh, you're married and you have children? Mm-hmm. How? Yeah, she's right around there. I a picture from last fall. Mm -hmm. She is uh, two years and three months. And any pets? No. Do you, do you say that as... Well, oh, I didn't grow up with pets. Oh, okay. So I kind of have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with Pets Ma mainly mainly hate. But there's some <laughs> some pets are small enough that I can tolerate them. In my in my building, actually, it's almost as if I have pets because in my building there's so many of these little white fluffy dogs <laughs> that you're constantly seeing these little white fluffy dogs that you kind of you kind of have a day to day relationship with these little white fluffy dogs. <laughs> and your your daughter hasn't started clamoring for any no, kind of them. No, no. Okay. But when she sees a cat, she always tries to pull its tail. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> the cat doesn't always like that. <laughs> she she loves pets. Mm -hmm. No, my, soon. <laughs> yeah, my mother was allergic. I mean, oh. is allergic and was as I, when I was a child. So it, it wasn't really a qu there was no question of having furry pets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what's something your students would never guess about you? Oh, I don't know. Maybe that I used to dance ballet. I used to do a lot of ballet. That's good. That's always the hardest question, but you know, that's a good answer. I just was <laughs> off. You know, off. The, I don't know. <laughs> um, that, maybe that's it. Okay. Um, and how how do you recharge? Well, I, I do yoga. I like to do yoga. Do you, do you travel a lot for work? I used to travel more because I used to do a lot of research travel, like going to archives and libraries. And recently, the book I just finished was based on research that I actually had finished the primary research in 2006. So um, I haven't had to do much of that kind of travel since then. And I do go to some conferences, but I don't go to as many as I used to because of having a little girl. But uh, um, I'm going to one on Thursday in hmm. Boulder. Oh, it's a good time to be in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. I kind of got, you know what, you can, I don't know if, I don't even know what the print of the interview, but I did, at one point, it was a couple of years ago, um, and it actually happened to be the summer I was pregnant. I totally burned out. I was, I was, I mean, I think I had something like, I think I had eight things scheduled in one summer, and it was, you know, in like three languages, in three countries, in five countries, in, you know, every, every conceivable, and I just, I just completely, and I just thought, you know, I'm glad I'm going to have a little girl at home, or that I'm going to have, that I'm going to have to stay home now, because I just, I'm not interested in doing all this travel anymore, I was never one of these, this, it's Tuesday, this must be Lisbon, kind of, it's just, it's just too tiring. Mm -hmm. um. The, oh, do do you have a do you have a favorite place in the world? You know, if you could, I guess if you could be anywhere in the world, where would you be? Well, I used to. Yeah, that's a hard one because is it a place just to go and be for a little while, or a place to live? Um, a, a place to travel. I guess to travel to. Where, to where, spend yeah, time. Yeah, to vacation to. I think um, 
it's a tie between Rome and Madrid. I spent a lot of time at the American Academy in Rome, and my first book was on this monastery. You can see the bell tower right there, the Abbey of Fagfa, and that's an incredible place, a magical place. But not a place I'd want to live, but a place I want, I like, I like to go to. And then my second book is on, um, it's on this, this Jesuit working in Madrid, in, in Toledo, but his his materials are preserved in, in Madrid. I've spent a lot of time in Madrid doing the research, and I love Madrid. Um, and what about in New York? Do you have a favorite place in New York City? Oh, no, I never even thought about that. What would be my favorite place? Maybe, I don't know, maybe Central Park. But I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe the, um, the promenade by the river. You know, by um, the promenade down in Riverside Park, which is actually mm -hmm. a, a recent development. Right, right. The one that's down below 100 and below, you know, around 900 Street. Oh, okay. Oh, um, that promenade. like right on the wall. The one above right, it? Right on the wall. The one right on the wall. Yeah, that wasn't but near built. the tennis courts. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't built that many. You know, that yeah. was pretty recently built. It's pretty, I, I do love it down there too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a place that I love to go. Um, yeah, I, I might be my favorite place. Okay. Um, do you have a, what's your, what's your favorite food? Oh, now that's a hard one because I like a lot of different kinds of food. Uh, spicy food. <laughs> I don't know, you mean like a specific food or does it, it could be a you, kind of food? You can say kind of food, specific food, oh. either, either one. Maybe Indian food. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, what on your resume are you most proud of? Oh, that's something I'm going to want time to think about. Okay. I don't know. Um, I would say it's a tie between uh, the Rome Prize, so I was at the American Academy in Rome, and then my book award. What was no, it? scratch the book award. Okay. <laughs> it was for my first book, mm -hmm. um, but I think no. I think in the end, I don't. I don't, I don't always believe in prizes because mm -hmm. I've now been on a number of prize committees, mm -hmm. so that the more committees you're on, the more cynical you get about prizes. <laughs> but um, no, I think the Rome Prize. So that's a fellowship to go. It's called the Rome Prize, but it's a fellowship to go to the American Academy of Rome for a year. Neat. Yeah. Is, um, is your husband also an academic? Or? Yes, he's a historian. Okay, does he teach at Columbia? Or mm -hmm. you, okay. What's, what's his name? His name is uh, Jens Ulf Muller. U-L-F-F -F hyphen M-O-L-L-E-R. Did you meet at Columbia? Or did you no, no, I, we met actually at a, a medievalist conference, Kalamazoo, which is a huge medievalist conference at Western Michigan University. It's kind of this anomalous <laughs> thing. It started many, many years ago when this German medievalist, I, I think many decades ago, he's actually since died, but a German medievalist went there, I guess, to teach and got really bored because he was in the Midwest and there was nothing there. So he started inviting people to come and speak and gradually it snowballed into this conference. And uh, it now has about every year, every May, it happens right after exams and when the dorms are free so they have the option, the option of staying in the dorms, which is very cheap. It has about uh, 4,000 people in attendance of all areas of medieval studies. And it expands outward also to kind of late antique and also to early modern studies. And a lot of Europeans go. And people go also from Pacific Rim, all over the world. Um, all, it's, it's a very, very international conference. And just in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That's bizarre. <laughs> it's, to non-medievalists, it's very bizarre, but to any medievalist, probably in the entire world, it's a household name. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's really funny. Was, um, were you at Columbia at the time that you met him? Or no, no, I met him in, um, I was a student at the time. I oh, okay. met him in 1991 oh, wow, okay. at Kalamazoo. And then a lot of Europeans were, were there, so. Okay, that's so he was living, He's Danish, he was living in Denmark. Okay. I guess that's why I keep mentioning that there, it's international, because he was Danish, mm -hmm. and he had... He didn't live in this country. He lived in Denmark okay. at the time. Wow. Yeah, isn't that well, funny? And what are the and chances? I actually you? know a number of people who've met their spouses at Columbia, <laughs> including someone I knew who, who's no longer at Columbia, but who was a Columbia colleague. Wow. Yeah. How weird. <laughs> yeah. It's really funny, but there's a lot of people there, so <laughs> statistically, it's possible I to mean, meet I, people. Yeah, I guess I met my wife at a writer's conference, so yeah. same thing. Yeah. Um, so, um, what's the last great book you read for pleasure, or a good book you read for pleasure? 
that's hard because I've been I was finishing my book, mm -hmm. so I hardly read anything. Yeah. Well. I read the New Yorker magazine a lot okay. for pleasure. I don't know if I can say I read a great book for pleasure recently because it's been a, it's been kind of a long haul getting mm -hmm. this last book done. Okay. Is that an exception? Yeah, that's fair, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I literally mm -hmm. I literally can't remember. I've been reading a lot of great books and primary texts, and I used to I mean I used to read tons of uh, no French and Italian novels, mm -hmm. but it's lately been and nose to the grindstone. <laughs> that you can print it. <laughs> um, and I think I've won, uh, and I, uh, um, what, so what kind of music are you listening to or what, what's, a, what's a last album that you bought or been listening to more frequently? Well, lately a lot of children's music. A lot of music together for my daughter. Um, and watch, we watch a lot of DVDs of ballet and opera. Mm -hmm. So probably the latest Thing that I would say, it's not the absolute latest because we got it a while ago, but there's an amazing DVD of the Rite of Spring and the Firebird of Stravinsky with wonderful reconstructions of the original choreography and a fantastic orchestra performance. And so, um, and that, that I really enjoy, both as a DVD and to listen to. Um, and I guess, you know, is there, do you have a, a recommendation for like something to see, so like a something to see or listen to in New York City, that you know, I guess a, a concert. It's coming uh, up. Yeah, coming up or. Oh, because this will be printed in July. Yeah, this will so. be printed, so it's it's kind of hard, but. Uh, yeah, because I could, I actually just noticed something that I I saw a reference to something in May that I would recommend, but oh. I don't think that's um, that's probably not what you have in mind. You mean how could I could it be something in general? Yeah, yeah. Like, because for instance, there's something that people don't know about. For instance, mm -hmm. um concert series of early music that are really enjoyable. One of them is at the Cloisters and in a beautiful chapel at the Cloisters and those are on weekends and you can find those on the website of the museum, Metropolitan Museum. And the other is a concert series at Corpus Christi Church on 121st that a lot of people don't know about. I've had my students, I've assigned it to my students to go to certain concerts there and they have really interesting early music groups and programs that are really, really diverse and fun. So actually those are both sort of in the neighborhood, but those are the two things that I would recommend. Okay. Um, I don't, I think that's it. That was fairly painless, I hope. Oh yeah. yeah oh great. Okay. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. I just wish I could think of the last time I had, it kind of, kind of 